So let me, let me first welcome you this Wednesday morning to the New America Foundation. Um, my name is Sasha Meinrath. I'm the director of the Open Technology Institute here. And our focus is more on sort of the tech telecom side of New America's work. And I'm particularly excited uh, to have this joint event uh, with the Heinrich Boyle Foundation, uh, Transatlantic Dialogue. So we've got a number of key players from the EU, the German scene, here to discuss some of their thoughts and perspectives on what's happening uh, w with regards to online privacy and security. And we're going to start with a keynote address uh, from uh, Danny Weitzner, who will be introduced momentarily. Uh, I think you will agree at the end of his talk that he's probably one of the most knowledgeable people in the US government today working on these issues. And I'm very thankful uh, that he is here, there, inside the belly of the beast, uh, holding the line often. Um, and I'm also excited that we'll have a pretty amazing panel of folks that are uh, incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, you know, I think about Congress critters here in the US versus MPs over in the EU, and I'm like, yeah, they hold their own <laughs> in a way that uh, perhaps in the US, uh, there's the staffers know a lot. but. Uh, uh, they will, I'm sure, have a lot of interesting things to say. I'm going to turn it over right now uh, to Patrick, who is, where is Patrick? Right there. Patrick Lucy, uh, who's a recent addition to the Open Technology Institute team, but definitely a rising star amongst us. He also does a mean Bernie Sanders impression, if you can catch him on a, a good evening in Over Pints. Uh, but he's done phenomenal work. He's actually uh, the wizard behind the curtain that's helped pull all of this together. Uh, and also happens to be a, a joint US-German citizen and fluent in German and a soccer aficionado. He may be more German, in fact, <laughs> than American. Uh, but no, he will introduce Danny and uh, get us started today. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Sasha. Um, again, my name is Patrick, and I'm a policy researcher here at uh, the Open Tech Institute. And I've been the one helping coordinate events um, for the DC portion of this uh, German delegation's visit here. And it's uh, a big honor to introduce uh, Daniel Weitzner. He is the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Internet Policy in the Office of Science Technology Policy at the White House. He was centrally involved in the uh, report uh, the consumer data privacy and networked world that the administration released earlier this year, also known as the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. Um, in addition to that, his areas of uh, responsibility include online privacy, uh, cybersecurity, internet copyright protection, and the global f uh, free flow of information on the internet. Um, prior to joining the White House, he was Associate Administrator for Policy at the Commerce Department's National Tele Telecommunications and Information Administration. Uh, prior to his service in the Obama administration, uh, Mr. Weitzner founded the MIT CSAIL, uh, Decentralized Information Group, whose mission is to, reach, uh, to research social and technical aspects of the World Wide Web. He taught internet policy at MIT's Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department, and was policy director of the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, Daniel, uh, Mr. Weissner co-founded and was the Deputy Director of the Center for Democracy and Technology and was Deputy Policy Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Mr. Weissner. Thanks so much, uh, Phil. Um, I'm really so uh, grateful to be here. Thanks to Sasha for the very uh, kind pre-introduction. I don't think I'm often introduced twice, um, uh, but, but I appreciate it. Um, it's wonderful to be here with uh, colleagues from the uh, Heinrich Boll Foundation. Uh, and <coughs> um, I actually had the privilege of attending the uh, opening of the Internet the Internet and Society Institute in Berlin at uh, the von Humboldt University. Uh, so it's great to see uh, the, the flourishing of, of research into these issues uh, in Germany and, and across Europe and around the world. Um, you have a wonderful panel. Um, and what I thought I would do is just try to give a bit of a, 
a framing view of how we as an administration look at the broader questions of Internet policy. I'll, I'll focus uh, on our privacy approach, but want to try to give you a sense of a of, of, of broader approach. You know, um, having been work, having worked on these issues for probably too long, um, uh, my frame of reference is really very much the Internet policy of the, the mid-90s when the Internet first kind of came on the scene. It was this sort of cool new thing and everyone was very excited about it. Um, uh, and the question was what was the approach? And the approach, of course, uh, in the U.S. especially and, and even to a large extent in Europe was a very much a kind of a hands-off the Internet approach, that was the bumper sticker uh, uh, for, for approaching uh, uh, regulation or, or the legal issues associated with the Internet. And I think in many ways that approach uh, uh, served uh, the goals of innovation, served the goals of making sure that the, the Internet could develop and, and spread around the world, which has of course happened incredibly rapidly. But I think we recognize now um, some, some uh, 15, almost 20 years later, that uh, the Internet has gone from, as my friend uh, Karen Kornblue, the U.S. Ambassador to the OECD, says it's gone from a exciting sideshow to the main show. Uh, it's obviously at the center of so much uh, in our society. It was certainly at the center of the administration's thinking about a number of public policy issues. So for us, the, the Internet was not just a, a kind of a sector that we had to make sure to, to pay attention to. It was really an enabler for a, a, a huge number of, of core public policy goals that we have. It was an enabler of health care reform through health information technology. It's an enabler of um, uh, energy conservation through smart grid initiative. It's an enabler of uh, education reform uh, uh, through personalized uh, learning and, and new delivery of, of, of educational services, just to name a few. Um, it's also, you know, we've come to understand um, central to, to, to our economy overall. The Internet doesn't actually get counted in economic statistics anywhere as a sector, so it's a little confusing. And for researchers out there, I'd suggest that's a great task for you all to, 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 to pick up. How do we actually measure and understand what's going on in this environment? But if you took the Internet as a sector, it ends up it's about 3.5% uh, of GDP in the top 15 OECD countries. That's a really big part of our economy. It's somewhere between uh, uh, a little bit larger than the education sector, a little bit smaller than the transportation sector. So this is not, this is not uh, a small deal. And, and I think you can notice, just looking at the U.S. government, we have a Department of Education. We have a Department of Transportation. We don't have a Department of the Internet. Um, and I think that's actually a good thing. Um, I think it's very consistent with the, with the horizontal nature of the Internet environment, uh, but it, it, it raises uh, a number of challenges uh, for us in how we approach public policy questions uh, and has, uh, for us at least, required that we work very deliberatively uh, uh, across a number of agencies, across a number of traditional public policy issues uh, uh, to make sure that we're addressing the Internet um, uh, with seriousness. I want to just identify um, three key attributes of the Internet environment that we've, that we've kept in mind if we, as we've approached uh, um, a variety of Internet public policy issues. And those are scale, speed, and reach. We, I think we've understand, understood from the beginning that the genius of the architecture of the Internet, both technically and socially in many ways, is that it's been able to scale up uh, uh, really extraordinarily rapidly from something that was a kind of a small little research and academic exercise uh, in the 80s and 90s to, to a global infrastructure. Um, part of that scale is reflected in the fact that just in the U.S. we know that we now have literally hundreds of thousands of uh, um, small application developers who are who are um, making a living, uh, uh, engaging in entrepreneurial activity all around the country. The assumption, by the way, is that those, those, uh, uh, those small businesses are somehow concentrated maybe in Silicon Valley, maybe a little bit in New York, maybe a little bit in Boston, but they're actually wi quite widely distributed uh, uh, around the country. We even have a tech sector, uh, kind of an independent apps development sector here in Washington, D.C., which is an extraordinary thing. Um, uh, so 
we very much want to be able to maintain that, that aspect of the, the, the scalability of the Internet environment. You know, when, when the U.S. courts first looked at the Internet um, in the context of uh, free speech questions in, in, in looking at a First Amendment challenge to the uh, Communications Decency Act and Internet censorship law, um, one of the things that the Supreme Court, that the U.S. Supreme Court noticed was that applying traditional uh, regulatory approaches that might have made sense in the broadcasting environment where you had a relatively small number of, of, of actors with a relatively consistent set of business models, that applying uh, uh, um, that set of rules to the Internet environment was really not going to work. And the Supreme Court found that it would actually end up restricting expression to apply these very, uh, uh, these, these restrictive sort of one-size-fits-all rules. But I th and, and, and the Supreme Court actually focused uh, in a way that I think we should really pay attention to, that if rules are not very clearly stated but also flexible, the Supreme Court worried that it would chill expression uh, uh, and, and, and chill innovative activity from amongst all these hundreds of thousands of apps developers, amongst all these hundreds of millions of speakers on the Internet all around the world. So keeping in mind this aspect of scale we think is critical. Second. I think we're all aware of the speed of, of, of innovation in the Internet environment, both uh, the speed of the development of new business models, the speed of the development of new uh, technologies. And we are very aware of the fact that we have to make sure that as we approach the development of, of new rules, of, of, of new laws that, that we may well need in the Internet environment, we have to make sure that the rules are able to develop flexibly to be able to keep up with the speed of innovation, both in new businesses and, and, and new technologies. If we don't do that, uh, uh, consumers suffer because they remain unprotected, and businesses and innovation suffer because they're, they're uncertain about what their obligations are. Finally, I think we can see that the Internet obviously has a global reach. It's had that from the very beginning in principle, but I think it's fair to say that it's only um, in the last five to ten years that we've actually see that realized in practice. I think that we understand um, that any business that operates uh, on the web is by definition a global business. Any individual who speaks on the web is by definition speaking globally. Any organization that engages in political activity is by definition operating on a global stage. Now, and I think this is one of our central challenges uh, in, in Internet policy making and I think especially appropriate to the discussion with our visitors today, is that on the one hand I think we understand that we are not likely uh, to have a grand treaty that answers all questions of Internet public policy arrive on the stage anytime soon. Um, uh, it's not clear it would be a good idea to do that at all, but it's pretty clear that even if we all thought it was a good idea, we probably wouldn't get there. Uh, um, and personally, I think that's probably just as well. Um, but what it does mean is that we have to work very hard to make sure that we even though we understand we're not going to have a single set of precise rules that can apply to all activity on the Internet, that we try to build uh, um, the legal systems that are developing around the world in response to the Internet, that we try to build uh, uh, these systems based on as much as possible based on a common set of principles. Um, I want to talk in particular about how we apply these, these three requirements, scale, speed, and reach. Uh, in, in the privacy, the consumer privacy work that we've done in the administration. And I'll very quickly just, just uh, highlight what our approach has been and, and, and illustrate how, how, the, how it connects with this model. Uh, as Sasha mentioned, uh, back in February we released uh, the administration's Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights uh, at the White House. Uh, it was the product of several years of of work um, across a number of agencies uh, in the U.S. government, a um, uh, number of cabinet agencies, product of very close consultation with the Federal Trade Commission, and actually a product of quite a bit of dialogue with um, our, uh, our allies and partners all around the world. Uh, um, it was product of quite a bit of dialogue in particular with, um, with the European Commission uh, and with, with European member states. Um, uh, because of the fact that we recognize that any framework uh, we would uh, develop here in the U.S. Um, uh, needed to make sense in a, in, a, in a global context as well. Our framework, the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, really has two key components. 
it starts off with a broad set of, of principles based on the traditional fair information practices, but updated uh, to address what we think are some of the challenges uh, and the opportunities of the online environment. Um, it emphasizes in particular the importance of individual control over how uh, information is collected and used. And also it emphasizes the importance uh, of establishing respect for context. I think we all understand in our daily lives that, that we um, engage in quite a bit of sharing of personal information, in the creation of quite a bit of personal information that we make very widely available. But at the same time, I think we also understand that, that we have expectations about how that information will be used, about whether the context in which it was originally created is respected in subsequent uses. So we think that that, that consumers really have a right to have respect for the context in which their, their personal information is used. All of these principles are based on the, the globally recognized fair information practice principles on the OECD uh, 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 privacy guidelines that have been um, a, a guide for the world uh, since 1980. And in that sense, uh, um, we've really tried to, to address this requirement of, of the reach of the Internet to make sure that when U.S. companies uh, uh, look at the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, comply with it, we hope as much as possible that they will be uh, actually uh, uh, also complying with a global uh, set of norms. The, w where I think this framework is, is, is somewhat different from what we've had, uh, what we've seen before in traditional regulatory frameworks is that we've said it's very important that we be able to implement the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights in a flexible, rapid, and scalable manner. So for us, these, these seven principles in the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights uh, right away uh, are serving as a guide for the development of what we have called enforceable codes of conduct. We would also like to see these seven principles enacted in statute. We've called on Congress to pass uh, consumer privacy protection legislation. As far as we can tell, we are the first uh, White House, uh, at least in modern times, ever to call on, on, on Congress to do this. Of course, administrations have supported sectoral privacy legislation in areas such as health privacy and financial privacy, but we're now calling for uh, a comprehensive consumer privacy protection statute. But uh, while Congress is, is uh, figuring out how to do that, um, uh, we uh, have asked the Commerce Department to uh, convene industry groups, privacy advocates, federal and state regulators, and academic experts uh, to take the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights and implement them in enforceable codes of conduct. And let me just unpack what that means. So that means, number one, uh, uh, in, in, uh, and the Commerce Department has already started to do this, the Commerce Department has identified uh, uh, mobile uh, uh, services as an area in which uh, it's important to develop uh, a clear code of conduct. Uh, uh, the Commerce Department is taking the principles, working with a, a number of stakeholders to uh, understand how to express those general principles in the context of mobile services. Secondly, uh, we think that this 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 set of uh, uh, this code of conduct that will come out of this this process of a stakeholder dialogue should be enforceable at the Federal Trade Commission under their traditional uh, Section 5 authority, meaning that, that companies or industries that take on the obligations of the, of the code of conduct developed through the commerce process will then be accountable to those principles. Uh, individuals uh, or organizations will have the ability to complain to the FC FTC if they see a violation uh, of those principles. Uh, and just as you've seen, uh, uh, the FTC act against a number of major uh, uh, internet services, uh, 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 internet platforms uh, in the last few years. Uh, the FTC has the authority today to uh, make sure that the promises made by companies in the context of these codes of conduct are enforceable uh, and, and, and actionable. This is what gets called uh, a multi-stakeholder policy-making process. Um, I want to say, uh, uh, and it's, it's called that um, uh, obviously because of the range of stakeholders that we think must be involved in developing uh, uh, any kind of internet policy, but I do want to say very clearly what multi-stakeholder policy making is not. It is not a code word for deregulation. We've done that. We've tried that. 
uh, when, when the Commerce Department, uh, uh, Secretary Gary Locke, uh, now our ambassador to China, uh, released uh, the initial administration uh, consumer privacy proposals, he said very clearly, we need more than just self-regulation. We believe, on the one hand, that, that the, the energy behind self-regulation, the flexibility of self-regulation can be a valuable component, can be a valuable strategy in developing flexible Internet policy. But it is very clear to us that we, we need to do more than just say the market will take care of all these problems all by themselves. That's why we put out this code of conduct, uh, this, this Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights as a set of expectations for, for all companies and as a set of rights that we believe consumers are entitled to. And that's why we have called on the Commerce Department to use uh, uh, its convening uh, authority, uh, its bully pulpit authority, to make sure to actually begin implementing this Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights uh, quickly. Um, I think that for the purposes of this discussion, um, there's one thing that really ought to be clear, that while occasionally uh, there's, there have been suggestions that somehow uh, the United States cares less about privacy, Europe cares more about privacy, um, I think it really ought to be clear, based on this administration's uh, actions over the last several years, that while it is the case that uh, we certainly have different approaches to privacy between the U.S. and Europe, that, that, that the commitment to, to strong privacy protection in the United States is, is absolutely clear. Um, and, that, and that we all, uh, U.S. and Europe, uh, many other countries, uh, face what I think is a common challenge in making sure that in this global Internet environment we have clear, enforceable, but flexible uh, privacy rules that can be complied with uh, all around the world by, by new services as they develop. Um, I want to briefly just touch on the way in which this model uh, that we've developed in the case of, of consumer privacy, this model of broad principles uh, uh, implemented in flexible uh, uh, codes of conduct applies in other, in other cases. There was a lot of attention, obviously, to the copyright debate, the online copyright debate in the United States. We had a big uh, debate about the SOPA and PIPA legislation. Um, as an administration, we've made it very clear that we think that the problem of global piracy is a critical one. It's one that needs to be addressed. It's one that uh, we are working very hard on. We work very hard with our allies to make sure we have strong enforcement efforts around the world. But I think the motivation behind uh, this legislation was to make sure that the gaps that exist around the world, uh, the fact that there are refuges really for privacy is something that we think is, is, is not a tolerable situation uh, that, and that we need a stronger, uh, we need stronger mechanisms for enforcement um, of, of intellectual property rights in the online environment. That said, we also took very seriously these principles that I articulated of, of scale, speed, and reach and said that we would not support legislation that reduces freedom of expression, that increases cybersecurity risk, or that un would undermine the, the dynamic of innovation in the Internet environment. Uh, we, we, um, we called on Congress to, to, to uh, uh, try to find a more targeted uh, legislative model. But in the meantime, again, just as we've done with privacy, we've been working very hard with uh, a variety of industry groups and other stakeholders uh, to make sure that we can, uh, that we have good best practices that are complied with uh, by U.S. companies and we hope by companies all around the world to make sure that we have specific and effective ways of addressing issues such as uh, uh, the problem of counterfeit pharmaceuticals online uh, 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 and the problem of other kinds of infringement that we think in many cases can be addressed um, uh, by, uh, through a, a voluntary set of best practices that companies can adopt, that they can adopt, uh, we think, uh, very importantly, in a transparent fashion with input from, from all the stakeholders. So we're applying this model across a range of, 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 of environments. We're also uh, very interested in how this model can apply in the trade context. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, obviously, um, uh, about the need to extend uh, uh, some of our, our free trade commitments into the Internet environment. We did this uh, quite uh, effectively, I think, in the telecom uh, services environment uh, in the 90s. Um, uh, we really, uh, again, recognizing the global reach of, of the Internet environment, um, 
commitment to free flow of information, commitment to freedom of expression online, and to, to limiting barriers to market access for Internet services and cloud computing services is a critical uh, priority for us. Uh, we began a discussion of this issue uh, with our uh, allies and trading partners at the OECD uh, last year. Uh, the 34 OECD member states came together in support of a set of Internet policymaking principles. Um, uh, and, and some of those principles we are now taking and applying, particularly principles on the free flow of information, we are taking and applying uh, in the context of trade agreements uh, that, we are, that we're now negotiating. In the, in the OECD principles, uh, we also looked carefully at some of the other questions of Internet governance, in particular the role of what we think are the critically important uh, Internet institutions, uh, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium, ICANN, and many of the other bodies that really uh, function globally to make the Internet actually work. As, as I think some of you may be aware, there are discussions now in various parts of the United Nations uh, that would uh, uh, that raise the question of whether the UN should perhaps assert uh, some kind of uh, formal multilateral control over the over the operation of these of these internet institutions. We've said very clearly that we think this would be an enormous mistake. It would be harmful to um, both the the innovation environment uh, in the internet. We think it would be harmful to the free expression environment uh, in the internet if we. Uh, subject uh, um, the free flow of information that currently exists on the Internet uh, uh, to a, a, a UN kind of one country, one vote style of governance. And we're very much engaged uh, uh, in this issue. Um, I want to just close by saying that for us, uh, we very much view the Internet as a work in progress. Uh, it has uh, been developing, as you all know, quite rapidly over the last several decades. But what we know is that um, only about 30 percent of the world's population uh, has access to the Internet in any form, um, about 2 billion users. Um, that leaves, by today's population measure, another 5 billion people uh, who are not yet served, who are not yet participating in the, the uh, um, uh, the, the information, the open information environment that, that is so important uh, in the Internet. And, and we think that in many ways um, uh, uh, much of the innovation uh, that is necessary to be able to make sure that the Internet can reach those people, can serve them, can provide the kinds of applications they need, the kinds of services they need, uh, the kind of support for democratic institutions and, and, and open economies um, is only just beginning. So there's a tendency, I think, at this moment to say, oh, well, we have this thing, it's all kind of done, uh, uh, it all works well, it's in our homes, it's in our businesses, it's on our, our mobile devices. Um, but uh, I think it's a mistake to look at the Internet as a, as a, as a completed uh, platform. I think we ought to look at it as something that's just getting started, that still has tremendous potential to, to extend the benefit it already offers to parts of the world. Um, and more important than anything else, we have to make sure that, that in the next phase of the Internet's development, it's based on the same principles of openness and free expression uh, and, and rapid innovation that, that has been so successful in the past. So um, let me thank again uh, New America, and um, I think um, I'm happy to take a question or two, Sasha, depending on how your timing is. Let's take two quick questions, and then we'll get the panelists up in front. Patrick, do you have a microphone right here? Voila, on stage left, great. So we'll take gentleman here in the lady in the back, get them both and then you can respond. Uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. Just on the, um, the Bill of Rights and the multi-stakeholder process, um, if I understand rightly that um, the idea is that there's a voluntary but enforceable code of conduct. But if it's voluntary, then a company doesn't have to sign up to it. So. If a company was to choose not to sign up to it, then the FTC couldn't enforce anything because it hadn't promised anything. So have you sort of recognized that potential loophole, and what are you going to do about that? That's a good question. Good morning. I'm Dr. Susan Aronson from GW. 
Um, I wanted to ask you if the, the United States is out there negotiating all sorts of provisions and trade agreements related. I'm having a little trouble. I'm sorry. That's great. <laughs> I'm Dr. Susan Aronson from George Washington University. Thanks for your comments. Um, the United States and other countries are negotiating all sorts of provisions related to the Internet in their trade agreements. And the language is similar but not the same. Um, and I wonder if we might, before we do all this, start looking at what are the actual barriers, like have GAO or the ITC do a study of the actual barriers to free flow of information on the Internet so that we know that our language in these trade agreements actually meets the problem? That's a good question. Let me address the, the privacy question first. So the gentleman is, is exactly correct. Uh, today, um, no company is obligated to implement the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights in any fashion. However, and, 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 and because of that, we've called on Congress to enact a privacy protection statute uh, that would, in fact, uh, um, make this set of rights uh, uh, actionable by, by consumers and binding on companies. We think it's time to do that. Uh, we think we've articulated a framework that has a clear set of rights and that provides business uh, uh, adequate flexibility to make sure that they can continue to innovate uh, and grow. Uh, in the meantime, however, uh, we uh, believe that, number one, there are many companies who have come forward and expressed an interest and a willingness in developing these codes of conduct and are prepared to be bound by them. Uh, the, the, the vast majority of, of the major commercial entities uh, in the U.S. on the Internet, in fact, do have privacy policies today and, in fact, are bound to whatever their provisions are uh, um, under the, the Federal Trade Commission Act. Um, uh, what we're proposing to do, what we're able to do, absent action from Congress, which is not a body that we control, um, uh, um, is, is, to, is to continue the kind of, 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 of discussion that has happened about what these voluntary policies are that companies take on, but to provide a greater sense of, of structure and a clearer sense of rights that we think uh, ought to be reflected in those privacy policies. Again, no one has to listen to us, uh, but we do, um, uh, we do feel that it's our responsibility to establish what we think are the set of rights that consumers are entitled to, uh, and we are working very hard with companies to make sure uh, that they're actually prepared to implement them and, 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 and offer them. And then, once that happens, we're very confident that the Federal Trade Commission uh, uh, will be able to enforce them, because I think they've shown over the last uh, few years in particular uh, 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 a very real willingness to, to hold uh, large global companies account uh, for any violations of their privacy policies. To um, uh, Professor Aronson's question about uh, how much we know about uh, trade barriers, um, I think certainly uh, there is uh, always more to learn about, about evolving trade practices. I will say that um, uh, really beginning um, uh, uh, quite some time ago, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ITA at the Department of Commerce and the USTR have been keeping careful track of the, the barriers that emerge uh, in, in, in countries around the world. Um, uh, companies come and, and um, tell us about problems they're having. Often those problems show up in the, in the news. Um, we had a dialogue over a period of years at the OECD which led to these uh, internet policy making principles that did identify some barriers such as uh, requirements in certain countries uh, that um, uh, data had to be kept in any given country, the, the local storage requirement we've identified as a real barrier to the development of Internet services. Um, I have no doubt that there's more to learn, uh, and I, I think it's a very important research exercise, but we, we know a fair amount now about today's barriers and are, are committed to being able to address them. Thank so thanks. Much, thanks. All right, so if I could get Patrick to come on up here. Uh, we, I know we're standing room only. There's going to be a couple of seats in the front. If the panel can come up as well, some of you that are standing up right now, there's seats right up here. Hello.
Hello again. Um, as Sasha mentioned earlier, I'm a German-American dual citizen, which is why I think he asked me to introduce people to help with the, the correct pronunciation. Um, uh, we have Konstantin von Nutz, who is a member of the German parliament, the Bundestag, um, from the Schleswig-Holstein region of Germany. He is a member of the, the German Green Party. Um, he is a spokesperson on internal affairs and internet policy. Uh, we also have Marcus Beckedahl, who was founder of the netspolitik.org blog 10 years ago and has been blogging there since. Um, he is also co-founder of New Thinking Communications and the New Thinking Store. And he also hosts um, Republica, uh, which is one of Germany's largest blogging and social media conferences. We have uh, Jeanette Hoffmann. She is director and co-founder of the Alexander von Humboldt Institute's um, Internet and Policy uh, Research Center. And she's also a research fellow at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin for Sozialforschung, or the Social Science Research Center in Berlin. And lastly, we have, um, for the American perspective, we have Gigi Zone uh, in DC. She almost needs no introduction. She is an uh, internationally known uh, communications attorney and telecom policy expert. Um, she is the president and CEO of Public Knowledge. Um, she's frequently quoted in the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. Um, she's been published at the Washington Post, Variety, CNET, and Legal Times. And she's appeared on numerous uh, television and radio programs, including uh, the Today Show, C-SPAN's Washington Journal, uh, NPR's All Things Considered Morning Edition, PBS NewsHour. And she is a, uh, uh, has testified at many congressional hearings in the past. And um, I guess I'll reintroduce our fearless leader here at OTI, Sasha. All right. So to get us started, I thought I'd give everyone a few minutes just to give us perspectives on sort of the lay of the land, how you view kind of things that are happening around online rights and piracy, uh, piracy privacy, uh, copyright, and et cetera. Uh, just give a feel for some of the issues that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, some of the conundrums or tensions that you see uh, in the work and the work of those that you are collaborating with. Uh, and we'll follow that up with a few questions from myself, which will lead directly into the highlight of the morning, which will be audience and Q&A uh, for the panelists. So why don't we just start here? We can work our way down. And uh, Constantine, if you'd like to begin. Thank you. Well, thanks, Sasha. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> thanks for the introduction, Patrick, and uh, thanks for the possibility to share some thoughts this morning. I just want to give you a short input on the current discussion in Europe and Germany on privacy, privacy issues connected with the Internet and mobile communication. To start with the one question I always get asked, many Germans get asked, um, in those discussions about privacy and the view on that subject in Germany, the question, so why is it um, such a sensitive subject uh, in your country? But you always discuss the supposed problems first and not the chances and the profits of the whole development. Is that the German angst, the German fear? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> And I actually think there are two main reasons uh, uh, for that uh, uh, sensibility that is actually there, I guess. Um, the first, it has indeed an effect on our legislation and the whole approach to the subject that Germany has confronted two different totalitarian regimes in the recent history. And second, um, I think there is some kind of cultural different approach but I'm convinced uh, that the US debate on privacy and the fundamental changes and problems just started. And I assume that it is going to be a very intense discussion also over here. So I think we will be actually very close uh, on that subject uh, in the end. The whole concept of privacy in Germany is based on the understanding that the only player on the field able to threat the privacy of the individual by ability to actually collect massive data, to scan it, to evaluate it, to appraise it, is the government. Well, obviously, today, new technologies have absolutely changed that. 
Today, single companies, even with just a few employees, can collect massive amounts of data and algorithms help, algorithms help uh, to administrate and utilize these data. An example for that fundamental technical driven change to the discussion is the whole good old debate on how many video observation in public space or how much video observation in public space we can take before the privacy is destroyed. All these old arguments get absolutely irrelevant in times that because of movement profiling through smartphone, um, all our movements get tracked to the meter. I get tracked and profiled where I stand, where I go, where I shop, where I sleep, and where I go on vacations or on a business trip like this without a single camera in the public space. Another area for the fundamental change is the relation between the employee and the employer. There are today technical possibilities and ways to control and to scan employees that led in Germany to a very strong discussion about employee data, data protection to protect that very sensitive relation between those who work and those who give work. To make it short, I think the key to the whole discussion on privacy in times of the internet, digitalization and mobile communication is trust. The trust of the individual not to be scanned to the bone, evaluated in any way, tracked everywhere, controlled and watched around the clock. But all this is technically possible today and privacy does not care if the data is collected for governmental control and security or for private economically reasons. But it contradicts our free society fundamentally and privacy is not something nice to have. It is, I think, in the US as well as in Germany, a fundamental constitutional right um, the government has to protect. So I believe we need strong legislation on privacy. It is absolutely no political subject, uh, um, so we agree on that. Uh, um, you can leave to self-regulation. We need a very clear frame for dealing with data and win the sustainable trust of the people for technologies that actually our society can benefit from immensely, as I'm convinced. One last thought. In Europe, especially in Germany, we have a very strong political dispute about what we call, I hope you too, mandatory data suspension. Uh, here, the legislator in Europe and in Germany is doing the exact opposite of what I have described, what we actually need. The government wants to use private companies to collect very relevant, very, very sensitive data about people for the case it could use these informations for various reasons. In 2010, our Supreme Court uh, has overruled the data suspension law from 2007, but there are still relevant political parties and people in Germany and Europe that are trying to restart this whole approach. Um, they are on the very wrong track of the autobahn. Instead of protecting individual rights through law and regulation, they delegitimize techniques and business models. So it is, uh, in my point of view, a political obligation to stop those kind of political approaches. And I'm very convinced together with a stronger growing civil society movement, we can take, have a very positive effect on these fast developing issues. Thanks so much. Thank you, Constantine. Let's turn it over to Marcus, who I, I saw you just put on a, a, a hoodie, which in the United States is a dangerous undertaking. But, uh, <laughs> but please, if you could give sort of uh, some, of the, some of the things that you're uh, working on as well. Yeah, um, thank you. It's a bit cold for me as a European. Um, <laughs> we are not, uh, uh, we don't have so much uh, clear air condition. Um, so uh, um, I was asked to talk about ACTA. 
you might know, ACTA is an international trade agreement uh, the United States already signed. Um, we haven't, or um, the European Union tried to, but uh, the whole process failed in Europe. And uh, I could speak for hours how it failed, but I just have five minutes, so I... Um, <laughs> shall be short. Um, you know, SOPA PIPA debate in um, as the United States, it's your country. Um, we were um, blogging about ACTA since 2008. Uh, the um, agreement or the debate started in 2006, but it was totally invisible. It was intransparent and uh, Nobody knew that there was um, happening something. In 2008, there were the first leaks um, of the ACTA agreement, and uh, it was the whole horror um, list of the entertainment industry, what they demand. Uh, a bit of SOPA, but it was a bit more horrible. Um, so over the next three and a half years, there was a debate uh, within some organizations, uh, within some um, Yeah, um, circles around internet policy, but nobody took care. And then the SOPA PIPA debate started here in the United States. Then there was the um, Black Wednesday or the 17th of uh, January where the Wikipedia um, went offline. And this was a very big story in German media because Wikipedia was gone. Um, not in Germany, but in the United States. And uh, we tried to spin to uh, tell the press, okay, our... SOPA PIPER is ACTA, you have to take care about, and in the, in the beginning it didn't work. But then something happened, what nobody had expected, in Poland. Poland is the next country to the right side of Germany, uh, you might know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Poland, lots of uh, protesters started jumping in the evening against ACTA. They, they jumped because it was very cold, minus 20 degrees or something like that. Um, but they feared um, that ACTA would, um, yeah, um, um, would control their online lives. And then something uh, strange happened. Um, the, um, the opposition in the um, Polish parliament, they started to use the anti-ACTA protests to be against the government and lots of other things. But um, in the next days and weeks, more and more Polish people were jumping. And after um, two weeks, German media started to report about it because the uh, pictures were nice, jumping Polish people, something <laughs> with internet, uh, nobody knew it, some anonymous masks, and nice story for TV. And um, we thought about doing our own protests in Germany. And uh, there was, um, with lots of partners in other European countries, we started the first uh, International Action Day against ACTA on the 11th of February. And we expected in Berlin 600 people. We told the p police, so we hope maybe there will be 600 people because it was very cold, minus 10 degrees. And at the day, we had 10,000 people in, Germ uh, in Berlin. We had up to 100,000 people in 60 cities all around Germany. And all the youth were on the street to fight for a free internet. So nobody of us expected it. Um, there were lots of um, parameters why this came. Um, but I don't have the time. But this day changed everything. It was a bit like a revolution for us. Um, mainstream media started to report about ACTA. Uh, we were in the, um, uh, in the TV um, news. Um, we were on the um, front pages of all the um, newsletters, um, newspapers and magazines. And it took one or two um, weeks until the counter-revolution started. Um, we were f starting from the um, newspapers where um, our demand was um, we need to reform copyright and the counter-revolution was oh we uh, need a stronger copyright. And since then we have a debate on copyright reform in Germany. And um, we waited 10 years for such a debate. Uh, the, in the moment, the debate is very heated. So we ho hope it will be come down. But it's, it was our chance to, uh, um, to demand something, to demand uh, th that we need something like a right to remix, uh, a bit similar to your fair use. We don't have fair use in Europe. Um, everything is forbidden what makes fun. Um, when it comes to remix. So we are allowed to do remixes on our computers in our home, but we are not allowed to share our remixes with you or with other people online. That's a big problem. We also have, since 10 years, only one way uh, dealing with 
sharing, dealing with file sharing. Uh, it's only more control, more surveillance, and uh, um, yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, even in a police state, you can't forbid sharing. We need to develop, uh, develop other models. So this is a debate which started in Germany. I think um, it will take the next generation to solve the problem. Um, it's always a problem with international treaties and um, the United States must be um, our partner um, in finding new solutions. But at the end, in the beginning of July, um, we won ACTA in the European Parliament. Um, this was a very short um, way to um, beginning of July. A lot of things happened um, before. And this was um, um, the uh, battle against ACTA uh, had similar dimension. It was so many people, young people went on the streets. So the uh, members of the Euro European Parliament they started to, to think about what is ACTA, oh, we have to vote on, what are the arguments. They listened to our arguments and we had good arguments. And then there was another dimension in the ACTA debate because uh, it might be similar to the United States, our um, European Commission as a state department or something like that, they um, did the deal on ACTA and it was totally intransparent even to the members of European Parliament. And um, the European Parliament is strong now. It's stronger than two or three years ago because of the Lisbon Treaty. So they have much more power, but the European Commission didn't understood that they have more power and they felt like uh, in the past they are um, the kings and the European Parliament just have to say yes to everything. And the European Parliament or the members of the European Parliament, they decided to vote no on ACTA because our arguments were strong and it was a, um, yeah, um, situation of showing their power against the European Commission that uh, in the future they can't um, do a, a behavior like this um, anymore. And this was my short overview. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. You crammed a lot of info into a relatively short period of time. Uh, let's turn it over to Jeanette, who's coming out of sort of more of an academic framework, but weighing in on probably one of the most contentious political issues. Entertaining. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to get back to Danny Weitzner's uh, um, keynote. Um, he mentioned the fact that, int that the regulation of the internet was for a long time something almost forbidden. We all started in the 1990s with a strong handoff approach. And it perhaps only changed when we got this debate about net neutrality, when people came to realize that the market perhaps is not the best guarantee to keep freedoms on the internet. I since then came to realize that the whole debate about internet regulation is somewhat schizophrenic because there has been strong regulation for a long time. It's not related uh, to um, the internet architecture but to content. Uh, copyright laws do represent a, for a strong form of regulation that in fact governs more and more of what we do on the internet. So there is already regulation. But when we think of internet governance and internet regulation, we think of ICANN as opposed to UN and similar things. And as Danny mentioned, we come to think of this in terms of multi-stakeholder dialogue and how to include civil society, etc., etc. Soft regulation is also a keyword in this um, re in this realm. But I think we it's about time that we apply such principles also to the field of copyright regulation. We do need to open this field um, of copyright regulation to civil society um, interests and concerns. The very fact that we still have trade negotiations that are completely secluded, open only to intergovernmental arrangements and a few lobbyists. That is just not acceptable anymore because it affects everybody's um, daily life. So these principle of multi-stakeholder approaches, more transparency, um, really needs to be applied to uh, future negotiations of trade agreements in general and copyright legislation in principle. Now, 
a few words to the domestic situation in Germany. As you might have heard, we've got a new party, the Pirate Party, which claims to be the sort of uh, representative body of the generation of digital natives. Whether that will, uh, whether that is so and remains so, is an open question because it's a very young young, young party, growing fast at the moment, being very successful at state level uh, elections. Uh, they got between 7 and 8 percent in three state level elections uh, recently. And they do have, as it seems, a major impact on sort of established politics. Um, um, Danny mentioned uh, the fact that the Internet has evolved from a sort of exotic or interesting sideshow to the main show. And this is also going on in Germany right now, and that is thanks to the Pirate Party. As you may know, the way politics work, the only thing relevant is that might affect their power. And the Pirate Party, to some degree, is challenging the political landscape, the established parties in Germany. Since they are su so successful at elections, the topics they have uh, come to be associated with really rapidly enter into the sort of central field of politics. And all parties nowadays have to have their experts on in digital politics. They uh, have to sort of would have to Twitter, uh, sort of organize conferences, workshops, and meetings to show how um, concerned they are about uh, the development of the internet and its, reg and its regulation. So there is really a change going on in the political discourse in Germany. And um, what we hope, whether we are sort of uh, um, sympathize with the Pirate Party or not, is that they do also have an impact on how we understand that we uh, develop political principles that uh, Danny referred to and who is actually getting involved in uh, developing these principles. The, the, the main hope is that uh, voters will have new avenues and means to express their concerns except for uh, voting once every so many years. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. So to bring down, to back clean up, we have Gigi Son. Copyright, ACTA, online rights. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say on these topics? Well, <laughs> so good morning, everybody. I just want to say I want to take her home. I want, to, I want you to come work for public knowledge. And I also want to thank Marcus for the great work that he's done on ACTA. Uh, you've really, it's amazing. And that's the first, I want to make three points. The first point I want to make is that the last 10 months, in the political sphere, you know, the digital rights issues have just exploded. I, I've been working on this type of, these type of issues, first media, communications policy, now internet policy, what, 23, 24 years, and the last 10 months, it's like, it, it's been unbelievable. Uh, digital rights issues, whether they be access, openness, balanced copyright and patent and trademark, and privacy are now sewn into the political fabric, not only of this country, but obviously overseas as well. And it's funny that Danny mentioned the sideshow um, quote because that's exactly what I had written. It's not a sideshow anymore. It is, it is really the main event, and politicians and industry have to beware. I mean, we are not yet at the point in the United States where people are voting people out of office based on their vote on Sopa Pippa, but we're getting darn close. I mean, Lamar Smith, uh, who's the, the, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, I mean, there were billboards in his district. Now, he didn't get voted out at the primary, but maybe the next time in two years he runs, he better beware. So, so the fact that people are now actually saying, oh, how did my member vote on Sopa Pippa? How are they going to vote on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement when that comes before the Congress? That is a major sea change uh, that's really only just happened in the last 10 months. So I think that that's critically important. The second point I want to make is about the love affair with multi-stakeholderism. And it's our government's love affair, and it's other governments' love affair. But before I do that, I want to make absolutely clear that what I say about multi-stakeholderism has absolutely nothing to do with my or my organization's pos position on whether the ITU should get jurisdiction over the internet. We agree with the US government heartily 
And we, we agree with our friends in industry, people we normally knock the living daylights out of every day, AT&T, Verizon, that the ITU's ex, uh, jurisdiction should not expand. So Lynn Stanton, I hope you will report that to everybody, because the last time I said these things about multi-stakeholderism, the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee got up and mentioned my name and took my quote out of context in the middle of a hearing, and I was like emailing his staffer saying, what the hell are you doing? That's not what I said. And, finally apologize, but um, so I want to make that absolutely clear. It was interesting what Danny said, what multi-stakeholderism is not. It's funny that nobody can actually really articulate what it is, but people can say what it is not. He says it's not a code word for deregulation. I can assure you, as somebody who is currently the co-chair of a multi-stakeholder group called the Broadband Internet Technology Advisory Group, which looks at reasonable network management in sort of the net neutrality context, I can tell you that that is not a universal definition, particularly among in industry players. And the BTAG actually was set up so that the FCC would not adopt network neutrality regulations. I'm quite confident of that. Why am I the chair? We can have another co uh, conversation about that. I still think it's an important body. There's really nobody looking at these issues from a, an engineering perspective. Uh, and this is uh, actually this body has worked out, but, but the, the fact that it is a code word for deregulation for some. And while I, I, I do think that in some instances multi-stakeholderism can be good is not the magic feather. You need to have strong government backup. I'm glad this administration believes that. I don't know if the next administration, if we have a change, will believe that. But that's critical. Peter Swire has written about this uh, in the privacy context. The other thing that concerns me about the love affair with multi-stakeholderism is civil society involvement and the lack thereof. The resources for groups like mine and groups like Sasha's and EPIC and CDT and EFF are not unlimited. And if the only way we're going to make Internet policy is through multi-stakeholder groups, there's just not enough of us worldwide. There's not enough of us. So somebody's going to have to solve the resource problem. You know, I don't know. You know, I think in Europe, tell me if I'm wrong, there's, there's more of a tradition of government supporting civil society groups. There is. Okay, great. So I'm wrong. <laughs> just makes matters worse. And there are just some questions that government need to decide. The only thing I disagreed with you on was when you talked about net neutrality as, an, as internet regulation. It is not. Okay? It is, is regulating the on-ramps to the internet, and that's different. And, and I do think in some of the conversations around the ITU, there's this meme that, oh, you know, we don't want to regulate the Internet like we regulate the telephone. And the, that is code for we don't want to regulate Internet access the way we regulate the telephone. And we really have to, we have to kind of split that off because it really is very different. Uh, on the other hand, I agree with every single thing you say about copyright. My last point, and that's transparency. And that is where this, I will say, my country, which I love very much, has been grossly disappointing particularly, uh, I see Susan Aronson, who I spoke to on the phone for a long time, nodding her head up and down, and the issue of trade, it's untenable. And, and, and what is really hypocritical is that on one hand, the U.S. government is doing the right thing in pushing the ITU to be more transparent, and the ITU just came out with this faux transparency uh, proposal uh, going forward, which was very, very disappointing and which we criticized heartily. So on the one hand, they're pushing the ITU to be transparent. On the other hand, I don't know what else my organization and the organizations working on TPP need to do to convince Ambassador Kirk to be more open with trade agreements. The answer I get from them is this is the way we've always done it. That is no longer acceptable in a multinational environment, in an Internet world, for, for international policymaking. So I, I am concerned that what the U.S. is doing over here at the USTR is hurting our advocacy over here at the ITU. Thank you, Gigi. All right, I have a quick question for each of the panelists, and then we're going to open it up for audience Q&A. And I'll just start here again and go down. So, Constantine, you'd mentioned in, in your comments the need for a clear framework for dealing with data. And I'm curious, you know, do you see movement towards sort of a digital bill of rights or some something that would enshrine that in terms of consumer protections, uh, either in Germany, EU, writ large? Well, right now we have uh, uh, the debate about the um, uh, EU uh, data protection directive, yeah, which is a, a, a 
which is going to be a very huge discussion because pretty much every uh, um, uh, company uh, is affected by by what is going to be uh, um, uh, ruled in there. They have a very short uh, uh, time frame, and uh, my uh, colleague and friend uh, uh, Jan Philipp Albrecht uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, uh, Green uh, uh, Party colleague um, is actually um, uh, dealing that whole issue, and it is um, the attempt to uh, get at least for five hundred million Europeans one frame, yeah? and um, we said in the political debate around that subject that it is worth trying. I see a lot of problems because of many, many different interests trying to get their uh, interests into that debate, and we will see how strong uh, uh, this legislative act will be in the end. But uh, in times of a global internet, it makes uh, not very much sense anymore to to just have a national perspective on um, especially subjects like uh, uh, data protection or net neutrality or whatever. So uh, um, I think we're trying that. Uh, Safe Harbor is an example from our point of view that international-wise, transatlantically, it doesn't work that well. Yeah, and um, but but I think as the debate speeds up. Uh, in Germany as well as in the US, there will be uh, uh, a higher pressure to find uh, international working uh, frames for those subjects. Great, thank you. And Marcus, I, I, you know, it's interesting. In, in the DC context, I look to groups like Public Knowledge, some of the work that we're doing, a lot of our allies that are in the space as kind of the watchdogs for government and industry malfeasance in a lot of these spaces. I love the idea. I would love to see sort of a jump-a-thon for the people like in front of Congress. I think that would be <laughs> amazing. Uh, but I'm curious about the roles that like some of the organizations you're a part of, NetPolitik or Republica, are playing, how this intersects kind of with the protests themselves and their role in being a watchdog on what's happening right now in terms of ACTA in particular, but beyond ACTA as well. Oh, so the question was what Netzpolitik and Republica, uh, which role What's they are the playing? the role that these organizations are playing right now in terms of their impact on politics and policies? Yeah, it's a bit complex. Um, so Netzpolitik is uh, my blog. It's a multi-user blog now, so around 10 or 20 friends are blogging there about internet policy. And we try to cover most of the um, topics around German, national politics, European politics, a lot of U.S. politics because it uh, affects us and um, everything else. Um, Netzpolitik is one um, main node within the new network public sphere which is rising in Germany. So you have always to say we are a German block. We block in German. I um, think most of you are not able to read us, so we have our language island. So only around 100 million people are able to read us, theoretically. No, most of them don't do it. Um, <laughs> so how yeah, many followers do you have? Yeah, some. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, but um, our goal at uh, Netzpolitik is uh, to cover most of the issues and to inform and educate our readers. And um, we always do it uh, in a form like um, we report about something and we mostly give options how to be active against something. And um, we are still in the grassroots level. We founded a um, an organization one year ago, Digitale Gesellschaft. Um, a role model was public knowledge. Um, so we cover <laughs> similar topics like net neutrality and it's uh, a bit hard to found such an um, organization because we have another fundraising culture in, in Germany. Uh, we don't have um, governments spending our money um, on NGOs, 
they have their own state organizations like the um, data protection agencies or consumer protection agencies, but uh, which are not really NGOs like public knowledge or us. But um, we know we have to develop um, lots of new organizations like you have done in the United States and it's a long step and we try to build up such a movement and we also try to uh, yeah, to uh, develop tools to be able to um, fight for digital rights um, better in the future. We need campaigning tools and stuff like that. And we are building a big um, coalition around Europe. Um, we have 27 member states in Europe with 20 different uh, languages or even more. I don't know. But it's even hard. Um, but uh, there's European Digital Rights. I don't know if you know it. etri.org. And on etri.org, um, we have a coalition ar with around 30 member organizations from all over Europe. And we try to share resources. And it's a hard way because most of the organizations have only uh, people um, being um, activists in their spare time. We don't have resources, but it's a good way um, we think we are. And the fight against ACTA showed that um, we are able to um, start a transnational, trans-European movement. A mm, lot of people didn't expect it, that it would be able because of all the language barriers. But um, we won ACTA and we hope that we will win further uh, future um, challenges too. Thank you. And for those that might be interested in German reading, what would be the URL they should point their browser to to check this out? Oh, netzpolitik.org and digitalegesellschaft.de and atri.org. It's English. So now you're saying we have to be at a spell too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Jeanette, uh, right, right before actually uh, we got on stage, we were having what I find a fascinating conversation kind of about empirical analysis, the role of sort of copyright optimization, the econometrics, and this balance that needs to happen in copyright. And I was hoping that you might talk very briefly about some of that work. Okay, uh, Sascha asked me about our newly founded research institute, and particularly he was, in, he was interested in what I'm going to focus on. And uh, I told him that uh, my contribution to this copyright war that, we, that now also has reached Germany, I want to escape it uh, by doing empirical research, uh, research on copyright. My idea is that the discussion we have on copyright sort of overemphasizes the importance, the relevance of copyright in regulating um, our exchange of cultural goods. And I want to show uh, through case studies what kind of norms actually regulate the trade or the circulation, the exchange of information goods. And there are indeed quite a lot of areas where copyright doesn't play, isn't, as, uh, isn't uh, the center stage or might not even play any role. Fashion is an important area, um, recipes, jokes, stand-up comedy. T uh, uh, comedy. Um, then there are areas like uh, TV formats, like Big Brothers. There is no copyright that actually regulates the exchange of and the sort of migration of these formats across the world. There are nonetheless uh, licensing agreements that um, allow companies to sell such uh, TV formats. So what are they based on and uh, what kind of other norms play into this market and in fact regulate this market? So what I want um, to do is challenge the central assumption that copyright is necessary to prevent market failure. I'm not saying that copyright is completely completely irrelevant. I'm saying it isn't always necessary and it might sometimes have effects not um, originally intended. And that is one, what I want to look at on an empirical basis instead of just adding to the normative debate that in my view ends, uh, really leads nowhere. Can I just, I just want to actually, if I could tag on to that, the kind of research that I've never seen, and it is kind of hard to do, is show what innovation has not happened because of copyright? It's kind of it's hard to prove a negative. I remember yeah. being in a room with a bunch of economists, I don't know, it was like eight, nine years ago, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how you would actually create a study that would show what, what hasn't happened. What's the chilling effect? I mean, you have things like, you know, Wendy Seltzer, you know, has sort of the chilling mm -hmm. effects project, but to actually show what innovation doesn't happen, mm -hmm. you know, what licensing doesn't happen, I, like I said, I think it's very, very difficult to do. 
Um, now, some of the work you're talking about has been done, like Chris Sprigman, who's a professor at University of Virginia Law, just put out a book about fashion copyright mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, how, well, the lack thereof and how you have this unbelievably vibrant fashion industry that hasn't stopped people like Diane von Furstenberg from trying to get copyright protection. I almost say, let them do it and let them, like, kill each other in court and see what happens. But it is a great example of how... Uh, of how you don't need copyright to innovate to make money. Uh, and I, I, I do think there are places where copyright is important, but you don't need the maximalist vision of, of copyright and copyright enforcement. So, Gigi, I want to bring us out on perhaps a lighter note. Uh, I want you to think about what it's like on the other side, right? So, ACTA, down in flames, SOPA, PIPA, massive blow up and public backlash. So pretend you're an old white guy smoking cigars in the back corners of the Senate Social Club. I, and I want you to like channel Chris Dodd and maybe remind people who he is. And tell us, what do you, if you're on the other side of this, what do you do now? So uh, if people don't know who Chris Dodd is, he is the, the uh, president of the Motion Picture Association of America. I just have to tell a funny little story, or at least I think it's funny. So I was at the oral, Supreme Court oral argument for a case called Golan versus Holder, which had, happened, had, had to do with retroactive copyright rights. And I saw Chris Dodd there, and I went up to him, and I said, hi, my name is Gigi Stone. I'm the president of public knowledge. He looked at me like I was you know, nobody, which, of course, I am to him. And I said, and he kind of looked at me and shook hands, and I said, well, you'll know who I am soon enough. And... Uh, <laughs> And I was eating, I was having lunch the other day uh, at a restaurant uh, downtown, and Dodd walked by, and he saw me, and I, he, he's pretty white to begin with, but he turned even whiter than his hair is, so it was pretty funny. I think he knows who I am now. Um, so here's what they're thinking. What they're thinking is, oh my God, these crazy misinformed net roots, they didn't know what they're talking about. Google, you know, had them transfixed by hypnotism. They have no minds of their own. Uh, we can't get what we want right now. So what, but, you know, but we're, we're motion picture industry lobbyists, so we've got to do something. We have to show our bosses in Los Angeles that they're, we're worth the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars or more, uh, if you're Chris Dodd, that they pay us. So here's what they're trying to do. They're trying to basically seed more and more copyright enforcement officials, IP enforcement officials in every nook and cranny in government. And we've already seen this. I mean, you know, SOPA's what, six months dead, right? So just a, a couple weeks ago, Smith, of all people, Lamar Smith introduces this IP attache act, right? Oh, this is benign. Yeah, well, you know, it basically allows the, the Patent and Trademark Office to hire as many people as they can afford to enforce copyright. Now, they already have people like that, okay? And it would create a new deputy assistant secretary. It would create a new assistant secretary position. It would, uh, these, these IP attaches would get promotions. And my spouse, who works for the State Department, who's over there, knows a lot more about this than I do, but would, you know, make them counselors and minister counselors, whereas they have now lower positions. So basically putting more and more money into IP enforcement. And that's not benign. Okay, because it says that this government is going to focus on, you know, more and more and more IP enforcement. The people that take those positions are not Gigi Sone, okay? You know, these are people who have drunk the Kool-Aid. They oftentimes have come from industry. If you look at who's at the PTO, the Copyright Office, these IP enforcement uh, offices, which are in the State Department, the Com they're all over, okay? I wouldn't be surprised if the Department of Agriculture had an IP enforcement person. We actually did a blog post on this, which, which lists the many people. So this is what they're doing now until they can get back to the kind of DNS blocking issues that we were talking about before. One other thing I need to mention. So that was the first thing that happened in the last couple of weeks. The second thing that happened was Senator Stabenow of Michigan uh, tried to basically put an IP enforcement coordinator in the Treasury Department. So this was just last week. So she had introduced an amendment to a trade bill that would have done that. So this is the modus operandi. Let's just spend more and more of your taxpayer dollars on IP enforcement before we have a national conversation. And that's where I'm really jealous about what's going on in Germany. We're still not having a national conversation about what is the right balance for IP, what is the right amount of, of taxpayer resources that ought to be dedicated to essentially protecting a handful of industries. Yeah, go ahead. Just add to that, 
My expectation would be that um, the IPR industry will look for areas that look successful to them and merge discourses. We see this in the field of security, internet uh, security. We can expect this with regard to terrorism and there might be others uh, I'm lacking the fantasy of uh, to, to sort of come up with examples, but it will be sort of merging of agendas. And what we saw with ACTA, and this will certainly go on as well, is sort of expanding the network of international agencies that can be used for um, strengthening IPR enforcement. Sort of border control is one of these fields. They spend a lot of money on educating these people, sort of making them familiar with the language and the goals and the whole mindset. I would expect this to um, go on as well. Absolutely. All right, so let's open it up for audience questions. I'm sure there's many. Do we have the microphone? Yes. We'll start right here, the benefits of coming to the front. Right here. Hello, uh, Herr von Notz, uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, just as interested about politics, um, why was a pirate party necessary in Germany? How, be, how come that uh, movement did not come from within the Green Party? And it's a sincere question, I don't know. And what are the major policy differences? Are there major policy differences on these issues between the Greens and the pirate party in Germany? <coughs> well, <laughs> it's funny that this is the first question. Um, <laughs> see, I kind of have a little um, different view on um, the Pirate Party story than Jeanette has. Um, see, the Pirate Party isn't the, the driver of the development. Yeah? It is a fruit of what is happening. The main thing that is happening in Europe and especially in Germany is, from my understanding, that there's actually uh, a civil society movement growing. And uh, yeah, there were 10,000 people in Berlin, but there were 600 people in Magdeburg. That is the quite more interesting number, yeah? That there are people in Magdeburg going on the street demonstrating against ACTA, 600 people, that is uh, remarkable. And that's not something that the Pirate Party does or moves. They are, you know, they, they, they are swimming on that, on that wave, yeah? And um, I think, of course, you have a different, through the different political system in Germany, because we have not only this uh, uh, majority election system, but we get smaller parties too. There's um, the possibility of more differentiating uh, your political opinions by going to vote. And uh, the interesting question for the Green Party will be um, who is giving, in the end, the more interesting, better working answers in in these issues connected to net politics. And I'm, you won't be surprised, I'm very convinced that this is uh, our party. Um, but uh, um, we, will, we will see uh, uh, how, it, how it works. I can't actually uh, uh, say there is some uh, fundamental statement where uh, uh, the Pirate par Party differs uh, uh, from from opinions the Greens uh, have. See, now, not making that to the big subject, but this party has um, uh, quite a, um, uh, a high uh, uh, um, uh, well, the public looks very close to them, but that brings good stuff and bad stuff. The, the party was pretty small. They had a, a thousand, thousand people in this party. And over the last two years, they gained, uh, uh, I think, now they're above 30,000 people. Members. So, huh? Members. Members. Oh, sorry. Members. And um, so, so pretty much everyone who always wanted to do politics for some time uh, got a, a member of, of the Pirate Party. So we will see in the end who is 
able to give differentiated and good answers in this in this uh, uh, subject yeah and uh, uh, the race is open we have next year we have a, a national elections and we will see how who gives the be the better answers the short answer is um, the Greens failed, like every other party. In the uh, five, six years ago, um, the Greens had good positions on net policy, yeah. but nobody took care. Um, Konstantin wasn't in the Bundestag at that time, and Malte just started to become a politician. But nobody took care about the topic in, in every um, party. And so a lot of people coming from this new um, rising movement, they thought about well, there is no party we can go into. We need to build our own party. And uh, that helped um, to show the other parties that they should take care more on net politics. And now there are lots of people, experts in every party who try to develop. Uh, and now... Uh, also, the spokespersons um, um, of every party, they try to be more internet affine, um, and so it helped. Jeanette? Um, the, the interesting thing is that the Pirate Party attracts lots of young voters, first voters, and also lots of non-voters. Um, so uh, it seems to symbolize something very much anti-establishment. Um, it's not only internet-related topics, it's also that they cultivate to be very dilettantic, sort of uh, the way they are dressed, the way they address political topics. They often say things like, oh, I have no idea, so I can't answer your question, either because they haven't decided yet what their position is on an issue, or because um, that individual person just has not much of a knowledge about that area. So they, and people seem to like that. They sympathize with this non-sleek, very uh, non-routine uh, approach to politics. That's one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing is that from a political science point of view, um, Political scientists think of new parties as an expression of a sort of social cleavage or conflict that isn't adequately addressed by the existing landscape of political parties. What we don't know yet is, first, if internet-related topics are important enough to sort of bring forward a new party, and second, whether the pirate party actually stands up to the challenge to establish itself in the sort of party landscape in Germany. Right now, it's even difficult to sort of say something valid about them because they change so fast. Uh, not only because of a uh, new membership, a growing membership, but also because they are themselves still very uncertain about important topics like copyright. They change their opinion rather frequently on these issues, also depending on who comes to the meetings and uh, sort of raises his or her voice on such topics. Right. And I hate to do this, but we are actually past time, and this always seems to happen where, like, <laughs> I lose myself, I end up with pages of notes. This is like <laughs> clearly the, the, the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these issues. And yet I also feel like this is a panel that has incredible depth of knowledge and where I'm leaving here with a whole variety of different areas that I want to explore some more. Uh, and with that, I'll just say, you know, thank you all for coming and participating in this. Thank you all for staying a bit late. Come in and glob onto them before everyone leaves if you have <laughs> a dying question that you need to ask. Um, but please join me in thanking this remarkable panel.